Chapter 1, Introduction, Part 1. Our goals for this chapter are to learn about computers and programming, to compile and run our first Java program, to recognize compile time and runtime errors, and to describe an algorithm with pseudocode. There's a lot of vocabulary in this um, chapter, so be sure that you are taking notes. Computer programs are uh, computers, they, they are the, the instructions that tell a computer what to do. That's all a computer program is. It's the instructions that tell a computer what to do. And computers execute very basic instructions very fast. They're much faster than any human could ever be. And um, a computer program can include a sequence of instructions. It can include some decisions. If this is true, do that. Uh, it could also repeat instructions over and over and over again. And programming is the art of designing and implementing computer programs. So putting these instructions together so that the computer does what we want it to. A physical computer and, and devices connected to that computer is called the hardware, and the instructions that tell the computer what to do is called the software. A computer, if you if you're able to uh, take the lid off a computer, and I don't really recommend that you do that because um, you'll probably ruin it, but um, if you were to do that, you'd see the central processing unit, the CPU, that performs all of the calculations and instructions. So any thinking that's going on, that's happening in the CPU. And th this is an oversimplification, so if you want to dig into it and find out exactly, specifically, how everything uh, in a computer works. That's another class. That's a lot more. We're going to look at a, a high-level overview of these topics, and, um, and it's sufficient for what we need to do right now. Storage is... Um, uh, Sorry, I just hit a, hit a brain brownout. Um, storage, we can look at two different types of storage, and one is memory, and that's temporary, and the other is storage, or secondary storage, and that's, quote, permanent, close quote. We don't really say that anything is permanent in the world of computing because you can always have a, a system failure that would, would cause your stuff to be lost. Um, but basically, we talk about memory as a storage area where um, it exists while the program is running. So it's just temporary, just for that, the time that that specific program is running. And we call that volatile. Volatile is a, a vocabulary word. That means it's temporary. And then with secondary storage, or otherwise just called storage, we call that persistent. Persistent is a vocabulary word that basically means that it stays there even after the power is turned off. Uh, peripherals are connected to a computer that allow the computer to interact with humans. They can be a keyboard, a monitor, a printer, any of those types of things are, are peripherals. And networks are uh, c computers connected to one another that enable them to talk to one another. You're all familiar with the internet. That's the greatest, biggest network of all. Uh, we also have a network at school, and you might even have a network at, at your home. This is what a central processing unit looks like. It's very tiny. This is blown up way big, but um, it's very tiny, and um, it's where all the thinking happens. A hard disk, and um, this is a pretty old picture, honestly, because you'll notice that this hard disk looks a lot like a record player, and um, that technology is being moved away from into uh, more solid-state technology that's a little bit more... Um, uh, robust and able to um, overcome any insults that might happen to it. With this picture of a hard disk, the way this worked was the read-write head, the little end of the um, arm there, would just float over the top of the disk. Um, any little piece of dust or any kind of jostling of that hard disk would cause that to fail because it would interfere with the reading and writing of the disk. So hard disks were as um, they were stable for the time, but technology has advanced, and there are more better, uh, better ways to store your um, your data than with a hard disk, as shown here. This is a schematic of a computer program, and a schematic um, basically just means a diagram. It means what's it what's it look like of your of your computer. So you'll see that your CPU is sitting there in the middle. Um, it's on what's called the motherboard of your computer. You've also got memory in there inside your computer. You've probably got a network controller. 
um, and ports. Ports are things that you plug into your computer. And what you can plug in is you can plug in a printer, you can plug in a mouse or a trackpad or even a joystick for those of you who are gamers. Um, you can plug in a keyboard, you can plug in a microphone or speakers or all different types of stuff into ports or a thumb drive to um, uh, expand your storage. And then you can also plug in a probably most likely all the time plugged in on the inside is the disk controller that um, enables you to talk with uh, either the hard disk as shown in the previous example or uh, some kind of solid state storage device that you have inside your computer right now. So the computer can talk to the storage devices, it can talk to peripheral devices, it, yeah, the CPU is going to be uh, calculating and communicating with all of it, these vertical lines in the middle. Um, are in, indicate communication through all of these devices and, and to all of them. Um, a monitor is out there on the on the side. Uh, some people would put that with peripherals attached to the ports. If you have a laptop, you know it's it's likely integrated. And Mac has the monitor integrated these days. Um, and then speakers may or may not be external. And then your network controller is going to enable you to talk to the internet. So it, pay attention to this schematic. Be able to identify um, the different piece, pieces of hardware, the stuff that you can touch and feel, which is, is basically what's shown on the schematic. The way that they're able to talk to one another, that's the software. So the software is what, what really is making all of this hardware uh, do its stuff. Computers are everywhere. Uh, this is an example of um, using rapid transit. We don't um, have these kinds of devices here in Phoenix, but if you've traveled anywhere, you might have gone um, to another country, to another country, or to a, a big city with rapid transit, and and use those little passes that you just hold up uh, to the scanner, and the the doors open either let you on to the rapid transit or off. Um, you may or may not have used an ATM. You may have um, used a scanner, such as if you're using the self-check at the grocery store. Um, you may have played video games that um, have uh, little devices in them. And now things are controlled. If you go to the library and you check out a book, if you don't check it out and you just walk out, you might notice that the alarms go off. And that's because every book in a library these days has what's known as an RFID, a radio frequency ID. It's a very, very tiny chip that is uh, in the book that will tell whether or not the book is uh, has been checked out legally. You might have a pet that has a microchip implanted in the pet. So if your pet gets lost, any vet can just scan the pet and find out who it is and who its owner is. That's an example um, of computers being everywhere. This is the ENIAC. This is one of the very first computers ever made. I want to draw your attention to that woman there in the back on the right hand side. Um, the men got all the credit. I hate to say that, but it's true. Uh, but there were a lot of women who worked on the computer systems too, and it's important for us to shine a light on the contributions of women in computing and, and finally try to uh, give credit where credit is due. You'll notice this computer is huge fills an entire room, and there are lots of plugs and switches and whatnot. Things have advanced quite a bit since the early days of computing. This, the ENIAC was built uh, back in the 40s. We are going to be learning the Java programming language. Java has a number of features, and honestly the primary reason that, that we learn Java is for a number of years it was rated number one by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, meaning that it's got a huge installed base, and uh, it's used in the AP exam, and it's used in many colleges as a first programming language. So it's a really good uh, place for us to start. Java is safe, it's portable, it's platform independent, meaning it can run on a computer, it can run on a car, it can run on a refrigerator, it can run on a microwave. Some of you might have a microwave with a popcorn button, and there's a computer that's figuring out whether or not the popcorn is done. Um, uh, we'll talk about the virtual machine for Java in a little bit. It has a vast library. It has a vast set of library packages. That means that folks have already wrote instructions for Java to have it do stuff, and we can just borrow that code that's been tested and works just fine. We don't have to start from scratch all the time. Um, and some people say it was designed for the internet. It certainly was one of the early uh, programming languages used in the internet, and uh, so there are a lot of a lot of solid reasons for us to be learning Java. 
for example, um, Java can produce applets that run on a web page. In your science class, you might be familiar with some of these applets that um, demonstrate different science topics. Um, we are not writing applets in this class. We are writing Java applications, and that's slightly different. With an application, you don't need a web page to make it run. With an applet, it does run in a web page, and that's the big difference. It's also important to note right now that we are not learning JavaScript. JavaScript and Java have a similar name, but they are completely separate uh, programming languages. JavaScript was made by Microsoft, and it only works with on the internet. Um, and and Java was made by um, oh gosh, Sun Microsystems, which has been sold to Oracle, so it's now owned by Oracle. And uh, it is a complete, full-fledged programming language that can write applications that do not re run, need to run on the internet. However. Uh, you can also write applications that do run on the internet.